Perhaps my clues in the last video weren't really specific enough. A video on Hunt Down the Freeman, of all things, sounds unusual considering it's a rather obscure game, especially nowadays. But unfortunately, I can't really get this game out of my mind. Like, it haunts me, begging me to make a video on it, even though every other avid Half-Life fan has already done so. Well, that's why I wanted to mix this up a little bit. Yeah, people have made videos about generally why Hunt Down the Freeman is an awful game, and an awful fan game. But those people usually focus on gameplay, because, well, Hunt Down the Freeman is a game. But I'm a writer, not a game designer. And hence I wanted to approach the topic a little differently. Instead of looking at the gameplay, because honestly I would give no better review compared to those before me, I'm going to look specifically at the writing of Hunt Down the Freeman. More specifically, the kind of story that Hunt Down the Freeman attempts to tell, in conjunction with the original Half-Life games. This video might be long, or it might be short, I'm not really sure yet, but hopefully it'll give you some more insight into why Hunt Down the Freeman is truly a flawed game from all angles. Before we start, I should give some insight into what HDTF is about, if you're unfamiliar. Be aware that I won't be explaining anything from the original Half-Life games because I'm under the assumption that everyone watching this is familiar with the original games, but maybe not necessarily this game. If you're not, please watch this video another time, after you've learned. I won't be talking about Half-Life Alex much because it came after HDTF, so it'd be unfair to compare it to that. Anyway, what is HTTF about? Hunt Down the Freeman, as advertised, is a fan game of Half-Life 2 where you play as the villain who hunts down Gordon Freeman. So, somewhat like Opposing Force, except it's the one and only goal of the game. It's in the title, after all. He plays a character named Mitchell, who is a Heku soldier in Black Mesa at the very start of the game. Eventually, a guy wearing an HEV suit, wielding a crowbar, violently attacks Mitchell and Mitchell swears revenge on him. The guy is assumed to be Gordon Freeman because, well, he looks like Freeman. Not by face, though. The rest of the game is basically your quest to build an army to work alongside the Combine and take down Gordon Freeman once and for all. All the while, G-Man is monitoring you and encouraging you to go through with it, under the assumption that Mitchell would be hired by G-Man if he succeeds. At the end of the game, it's revealed the person who attacked Mitchell wasn't Gordon Freeman. It was one of his allies set up by G-Man. Mitchell is absolutely enraged and he kills his ally, before swiftly ordering his army to go to the Borealis, and then the game ends. Now, I know I went through that really quickly, but I'm sure you are already very confused. Trust me, even after you play through the game in its entirety, you will be just as confused as you are now. Maybe even more confused. But, as much as I would love to quickly pounce on all of the issues in my summary alone, I want to take things at my usual pace. That is, to look through the story events in order, and slowly dissect them, until I collect all of my bullet points at the end in one grand yell fest of a video conclusion. Maybe. Let's start from the very beginning. Before the game officially starts, you're greeted to a pre-rendered flashback. This is already quite unusual for a Half-Life game, as often they begin with immediate gameplay or a G-Man speech. The G-Man speech is actually in-game though, it's not pre-rendered, so this is quite a deviation from the typical format of a Half-Life game. But, maybe this cutscene is vital to the game story, so let's look through it. Presumably, a younger Mitchell hears and sees that someone has been shot, likely suicide, in his home. We also see this young fellow, Yes, he is actually somewhat important, believe it or not. Next, we see a couple leaving Mitchell behind, along with the young fellow we saw just moments ago. Then, Mitchell is in an alley, and he sees an advert for the Marines and decides to join. We see Mitchell in the military training, also shown in the tutorial for the game. Finally, we see Mitchell alongside other soldiers, quite possibly in Black Mesa. The final major scene is where the game begins, in which Mitchell is battling with a Black Ops soldier. He wins the battle, and the game finally starts. Now, uh, I have come through the entirety of this game front to back. Absolutely none of this information is relevant to the game, besides the exception of this guy and the fact that Mitchell has been involved in the military. Let's firstly start why none of this information is needed. Mitchell's past never comes up, besides what happens in the game itself. There's no mention of his parents having abandoned him or killed themselves in the game. I suppose it's just there to get you attached to Mitchell, but Unfortunately, I can't make sense of this cinematic. I don't know what's happening in it. Someone dies, two more people leave Mitchell behind, suddenly Mitchell joins the military. He seemingly appears in and out of Black Mesa a couple times. I don't know who these people are, and I don't know what these events are meant to represent. 
I just have to speculate. I can't really get attached to a character who is just based on my own speculation. This game has a problem with tell don't show, so it's weird that this game went out of its way to hardly explain any of this. It's hard to say what the point of the cinematic was. Secondly, the seeds I mentioned as being somewhat important, such as Mitchell being trained in the military, are not necessary to understanding who Mitchell is. When the game actually starts, you're approached with a deceased black ops, who you presumably murdered. You're also immediately greeted by the Black Mesa logo, indicating you are in Black Mesa. You also have a firearm and a camo outfit. It can be quickly assumed from these small hints alone that you are a Heku soldier, amidst the Black Mesa incident. So there was no need to show Mitchell getting into the military, because we can already assume it with the hints here. As for this fellow, all I'll say now is he's not major to the story. He's just an important part of Mitchell's backstory, I suppose. And we all know how valuable Mitchell's backstory is in this game. Yeah, that's sarcasm. So none of this opening cinematic was useful in any manner. You could have just maintained the classic Half-Life formula and cut it all together, but chose not to in favor of a pointless cutscene. Already a red flag for this game's storytelling. Now we start the game. You get the idea that, since you start in Black Mesa, you're basically playing Opposing Force the sequel, as you go after Freeman during the Black Mesa incident. We didn't need a clone of Opposing Force, but fine, if that's the direction the game wants to go in. Oh, right, they don't focus it on this time period. Later in the game, you eventually end up 20 years in the future, where you hunt down Freeman during the events of Half-Life 2. Another question has probably popped in your head by this point. How on earth does this game handle a time jump that massive while staying linear like the other Half-Life games? Answer, it doesn't. You actually jump in time. Looks like another deviation from the Half-Life formula. But these time jumps weren't even necessary. My advice, if your goal is to have a character who wants to hunt down Freeman in the Half-Life 2 time zone, then make the game start during the Half-Life 2 time zone. It could be after Freeman shows up, it could be shortly before. It could even take place while Freeman is stuck in the Nova Prospect teleporter. Then you're more likely to avoid large time jumps. Though you may still need to move days along at an abnormally fast pace, like at the start of Half-Life 2. That's an improvement over the 20 year time jumps anyway. Give us a whole other motivation as to why Mitchell hates Freeman. Or even make it the same motivation, but hint at it rather than explicitly showing it through a flashback or something. It's fixable is my point. There were easy ways to avoid breaking Half-Life's formula, and yet they did it twice. That's another red flag for this game's story. Okay, okay, I've ranted for a little while and we haven't even gotten past the starting area. So let's proceed. Mitchell is alone and attempts to find other soldiers with his radio signal. Assumedly, since the Black Ops are active, this takes place after Chapter 9, Apprehension, of Half-Life. And considering the Heku soldiers are not attempting to leave in a mass panic, this probably takes place before Chapter 13, Forget About Freeman. So this is a pretty small time slot, but Freeman is still indeed active on Earth. So unless the hints just miscommunicated to me, the time slot makes sense so far. And I can appreciate this game doesn't try to be blatant about this time slot. Mitchell comes into contact with a load of dead soldiers in a large room. The room which Mitchell will be attacked by the HEV wearer. It's implied the HEV wearer took out the soldiers that Mitchell was attempting to locate. And for unknown reasons, he decides to attack Mitchell with a crowbar, which leaves him alive. Now why, I wonder, would the HEV wearer wait for Mitchell in this location, having to go out of his way to murder a large group of soldiers? Why not hide and wait for him in a quieter area? Make his job a little easier? This particular area has no significance. Though admittedly having the dead soldiers in the room is a nice piece of storytelling. It indicates the dangerous threat is nearby, or has passed by recently. Though still a bit of an unusual storytelling choice to make it a large group of soldiers rather than just one or two strangers. Stragglers. And considering this Black Mesa section lasts a grand total of 30 minutes, there could have been an opportunity to stretch it out more by having soldiers slowly disappearing before Mitchell becomes the final target. They're not necessary changes, just recommendations to make the story a little more coherent. Now, I have a lot more to say, but I'll save it for when the plot twist is revealed near the end of the game because it provides a lot more context. By then, I may have more to add anyway. Mitchell gets beat up, swearing he will kill the HEV wearer no matter what it takes. Unusual considering Mitchell was extremely close to death in this situation, and he does in fact die in a little moment. Curiously, it's not implied Mitchell is aware Freeman has been killing large swaths of HECU soldiers. On the contrary, we see Mitchell fighting the Black Ops, and Freeman certainly isn't part of their team, so he can't be motivated by wanting to take vengeance for the sake of his fellow soldiers, because that's not explained by the story. And considering this HEV wearer seemingly just appeared in the room where the soldiers were killed, implying, if anything, he had nothing to do with their deaths. He just seems to be unusually angry at this particular HEV wearer for beating him up with a crowbar. To be fair, I'd be upset too, but not to the point of wanting to hunt him down for 20 years though. Speaking of, upon hearing this request, G-Man approaches Mitchell as he dies. Yeah, for some reason there's a flatline sound heard. I guess G-Man can bring people back from the dead. 
Good for him. Also kind of funny how coherent Mitchell was before being knocked out despite being near death. G-Man explains he's impressed that Mitchell made it out of Black Mesa alive, despite his intention being for Mitchell to die, for unknown reasons. G-Man is fascinated by Mitchell's ability to defy odds and survive against certain death, besides the time he flatlined, I guess. So he decides to hire Mitchell to see if he is capable of going through with his promise to kill Gordon Freeman. Now, I can certainly accept this as a motivation for G-Man. As proven in Half-Life, Half-Life Alex, and Half-Life Opposing Force, G-Man is fascinated by those who can withstand certain death. And so naturally, Mitchell would be of interest to him. Especially considering he survived Gordon Freeman of all people. G-Man saying he wants Freeman dead is unusual initially because he has also hired Freeman, but considering the plot twist revealed later on, it makes a little more sense. Until it doesn't, of course. It could just be a part of G-Man's unknowable motivations, even if they don't make much sense. But I'll get into that later. For now, G-Man doesn't want Mitchell to kill Freeman. Now you'd expect Mitchell to get thrown into stasis for that reason, but no, he doesn't. He's expected to live all 20 years until Freeman returns, twiddling his thumbs, potentially risking Mitchell losing his fire to kill Freeman, which actually happens. Again, we'll get back to that later on. Now Mitchell wakes up in a hospital, which he somehow got escorted to. We never find out how, he just did. After running around aimlessly, Mitchell comes across a couple of soldiers. One of them is named Nick, and he explains to Mitchell that the Combine are invading. Within just two hours, the military was wiped out. Impressive, considering the war was meant to last another five hours, apparently without the military. As Mitchell goes outside, the player is directly approached by the Seven Hour War. Now, someone else who made a hunt down the Freeman video mentioned this. But I feel like something like the Seven Hour War is not something you should put into a video game. Not only is the point of the war to eliminate humanity, or at least the majority of it, but also it's just so grand in scale that it's difficult to imagine in a video game. Especially a game not officially crafted by the geniuses at Valve. Mitchell being planted right in the middle of a city, where he'll get the strongest side of the Combine, was probably the worst place he could have been. Though considering he can fight off several newly introduced Combine soldiers in large amounts and with seemingly little difficulty, then that means this isn't yet the full brunt of the Combine. Though that puts into question why so many more people did survive the attack. Either that or Mitchell is just extremely powerful. Nah, sorry man, you're no Gordon Freeman. My point in all of this is, it's a miracle that Mitchell survives the Seven Hour War. Same with a lot of other soldiers, considering the military has supposedly collapsed. And for Mitchell to survive, the Seven Hour War unfortunately had to be downgraded significantly in scale to make it believable. Even considering the Combine were somehow powerful enough to take down the entire US military before then. So yeah, probably don't put the Seven Hour War in your video game, especially if it's in a city. Or at least don't plant your main character right in the middle of it. After a bit of wandering, Mitchell meets Adam, a sniper who was formerly part of the Black Ops before the war started. Adam wants to escape the city with Mitchell, but because the two conflict, they argue about how the HECU and the Black Ops were morally in the wrong, but in the end they decide to work together. This is certainly an interesting conversation. Adam brings up that both of the military teams did the same things, and that they were both just following orders and neither of them deserve each other's hate. But I mean, Mitchell's anger is fair. The Black Ops did kill the HECU and vice versa. Adam wants Mitchell to realize he's on the same level as him morally perhaps even above him in morality. But this scene isn't presented as the two working together to face a greater foe. They just have really good temper, I guess. Because for all intents and purposes, this argument should have gone deeper than it did. They're still conflicting. They just said that they did similar things, and I guess that means they should trust each other now. Certainly missing a piece here. Also, the entire time, Adam is not guarding the outside with his rifle, so I guess they're about to be invaded by many, many soldiers. Except they aren't. And they escape the building somehow. Fair enough. Mitchell escapes into the sewers and eventually meets back up with Adam and Nick. They then meet up with a large military group who have a plan to escape the city by going to California from New Mexico via train and then sailing the sea to escape the Combine's watch. Before then, though, the group decides to listen to a radio broadcast where they hear President Keemstar announce humanity's surrender to the Combine after seven hours of battling. All right, all right, one issue at a time here. Firstly, who decided the president of the US could just surrender the entirety of the country over to the Combine? I kind of just assumed the surrender was implied because all major figures of power were killed or captured because that would be very advantageous for the Combine. But alas, the president is alive and fine. Also, he announces humanity will press on and fight, as if the Combine would definitely be listening to the broadcast and be very upset at this new promotion of revolution. As for the rest of the world, I guess they also surrendered after seven hours, otherwise it'd be awfully narcissistic for the time it took the US to surrender to be the worldwide name of the war. And man, I know Keemstar didn't really run off the direction at all, but he knew this was meant to be a solemn moment. He really does not deliver the well. 
and I guess that's what happens when you get Keemstar of all people to voice act. Secondly, this plan may be the best way they have to escape the city, but it relies on a whole lot of luck. To get to California, they have to go by train, which is very vulnerable and exposed to the Combine forces. They'd be extremely lucky to survive. And alas, only Adam, Nick, and Mitchell survive being all the way in the front of the train, which for some reason wasn't destroyed along with the rest of the train. Or heck, wasn't the first thing to be destroyed considering it allows the entire rest of the train to move. But fine, the Combine don't seem to be very smart in this game anyway. Also, during the aforementioned surrender scene, we get hints that Adam knows more than he lets on. However, it's presented in an odd way. First, Nick explains why he thinks the Combine are smarter than previously thought, saying that they targeted specific places to cripple humanity. But then Adam parrots what Nick said, and for some reason when Adam says it, it's suspicious to the other characters. Frankly, the phrasing was not different enough for it to seem like Adam said anything besides what Nick had reasoned on his own, though the attempt at foreshadowing was very neat, even if it kind of failed in execution. After the train ride, you meet yet another military group who have to travel the rest of the way to California by car. They're currently in Nevada, meaning they have quite a way to go before they make it to California's coastline. But I mean, obviously they're gonna evade the Combine nearly entirely along the way. The Combine forces really just gave up after Earth's surrender. Before they make it there though, Mitchell runs into some guy in a factory. He says there's a gas leak in the building and he can't use a gun or else it'll blow up. But then the guy uses a gun and the building doesn't blow up. Well, that was pointless. And this guy's completely irrelevant after this point. We finally make it to the ship and meet again with everyone from our squad. Apparently Mitchell drove all the way to California's coast on a tank, by the looks of it, in one day. My suspension of disbelief can go no further. Mitchell meets the captain of the ship, and the Combine that were just attacking a moment ago have seemingly completely vanished. Nick gets upset that the captain is kissing Mitchell's rear end, and exclaims that everyone at the top of his command has died, and that Mitchell seems to be cursed. Nick is referring to exactly two people who have died, that being the leader of the first military group we met in the city, and he also refers to another sergeant, but honestly I have no idea who he's referring to. He has no reason to be making a conclusion this brash based on two instances of something happening. Alas, the leader of the group was not the only one who died, because the entire military group was killed too. So really, it's just one person you could maybe set as a proper example. But somehow the captain is convinced of Nick's fantasy and insists he will be in charge. And then he dies. He concludes Mitchell actually made a deal with the devil, who was meant to refer to G-Man. But he has no reason to believe this. The curse, sure, maybe at this point, but a deal with the devil seems like a big stretch. Everyone is jumping to some weird conclusions today. Anyway, Mitchell becomes captain, and because he's protected by G-Man, he's not gonna die for the time being. And, uh oh, black screen. Oh, I see, we're jumping three years ahead into the future, and we're being pumped full of exposition with absolutely no visuals on the screen. Fun. Basically, the countries got destroyed, the Combine replaced all human governments, used Reen as their Earth representative, and then started to sap Earth's resources away. People were gathered in cities and experimented on. So, all the stuff we learned about in Half-Life 2. To escape the Combine's constant barrage, the squad need to move to a Combine station in Alaska. Seems logical, escape the Combine by going towards the Combine. When we return to gameplay, we are presented with a very large snowy mountain area. The Combine are patrolling the areas using snipers and a weird spotlight blasty thing. If you're familiar with the gameplay of this section, you should know that this is essentially the roadblock in most non-cheated playthroughs. Now people have talked about why this gameplay is absolute trash, but this actually puts into perspective why this section of the story is highly flawed as well. See, if Mitchell was literally incapable of passing through this heavily guarded area without being completely invincible, then this part of the story logically cannot work. He's patrolling into a place so dangerous that its chances of survival are practically zero, unless you're somehow so skilled that you maneuver every defense system without cheating. If it's this impossibly hard for the story to progress, likely because the player is ill-informed on what to do, it shouldn't progress like this. Mitchell should have used another path rather than just running headfirst into the sight of many dangerous weapons. Or, heaven forbid, cut this section altogether. Do what I said near the start of this video and don't start all the way in the past. Also, another question arises. Mitchell and the gang escape onto a ship right at the end of the pre-time skip section. That is to say, they sat around on their bottoms for three years not doing anything. Why'd it take them three years to get to Alaska from California? It's not like it's that far. Besides, they surely would have run out of supplies very quickly, and going on land is extremely risky according to them. None of this is explained in exposition, so it can be assumed they dropped off every now and then to find supplies for a whole ship crew. Lucky they survived that long and got very little done in that time. At least they won't proceed to imply the exact same thing for a much larger time skip later on. Anyway, after navigating the snowy death trap, Mitchell finds himself in the Combine base. He meets a man named Boris and his daughter Sasha, who happens to be running a child labor factory. 
This is in reference to the Half-Life 2 beta, where there would be child labor factories, before the suppression field became a plot point. Thankfully, it makes a little more sense to be a mere three years after the Combine invasion, given that children would still definitely exist now. Boris expresses disgust that the Combine are enslaving children, but he does it against his will to keep his daughter safe. Mitchell cuts in and expresses he is not disgusted because he know humanity would have done the same to other aliens that the Combine did to humanity. Although he is probably right concerning the minority of those who could not care less for human slaves, but I think a large majority of humanity has enough sympathy to understand that other creatures and other humans deserve mercy. This just sounds like a very psychotic statement for Mitchell to be saying. And Mitchell also calls Boris a good man despite him running a child slave factory and doing nothing to go against it. Seems rather immoral to sacrifice a hundred children to save one child, quite frankly. Though considering what Mitchell just said, I guess that would make sense with his logic. Doesn't make him look like a very sympathetic character that we want to see succeed, though. Then Mitchell plans on destroying the factory and taking all the child slaves with him to turn into a new army. So really, not a whole lot different compared to what the Combine have been doing to the children. He admits it's immoral, so again, not too sympathetic of a character you've got here. And no, he won't be getting better later on. No redemption arc or anything. After that, Mitchell then has to fight the Combine after telling Boris and Sasha to escape. Although it doesn't appear that anything happened between when the last scene ends and the next begins. The implication is that the factory was destroyed and the children escaped. Then one flash of black later and we skip 17 years into the future. Yep, a whole 17 years just like that. No exposition dump like the last time, no time cards, nothing. We're 17 years into the future now. And because there's no exposition, unfortunately that earlier implication I mentioned of the gang sitting on the rear ends doing nothing and somehow surviving is once again valid here. The point of the time skip was to show how Mitchell's child army grew up, considering they are all adults 17 years later. We're back on the same ship as before the first time skip, now with another army. How do we know the time skip even happened at this moment? Well, now Nick looks very different, and Adam and Mitchell look nearly exactly the same, just with slightly graying hair. Mitchell finds Adam and Nick, and Adam hands Mitchell a gift for the captain, which is a crowbar. Mitchell gets very upset and demands everyone leave. Then boom, sudden G-Man appearance. Mitchell is very distressed about G-Man's rewards, being that he has to live through all of the Combine rule. When G-Man suggests that Mitchell hold his promise of hunting Gordon Freeman, finally, Mitchell doesn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, remember the title of this game? Moot. Mitchell doesn't want to hunt down the Freeman anymore. G-Man threatens Mitchell that if he doesn't hold his end of the deal, he will be faced with a battle he has no chance of winning. This is a reference to the end of Half-Life, where if you reject G-Man's deal, he throws Freeman into an area filled with Zen monsters. Quite an unusual reference to make, especially considering he doesn't follow it up by calling it an anti-climax. Oh well, I guess it works. It just feels a little awkward, maybe because this is just about Mitchell holding his end of a bargain rather than outright being hired by G-Man. Apparently G-Man was the one who left the crowbar for Mitchell, and now he has to return it to Gordon. That ties into Barney mysteriously having a crowbar for Gordon at the start of Half-Life 2, meaning that Gordon has not yet appeared from stasis yet. Pretty neat tie-ins to the original game, quite honestly. I'm not that upset about it. I think it's just strange that G-Man didn't put Mitchell into stasis, considering he very much does not have any motivation to take down Freeman anymore. Curious. G-Man disappears, and Mitchell is now convinced to go hunt Freeman. Nick pleads with Mitchell to stop and is upset that Mitchell seemingly cares nothing for his army or his people and selfishly wants to hunt Freeman. Mitchell is now on his own with his army to go to City 17 and hunt Freeman. I have nothing much to complain about here, surprisingly. Both Nick and Mitchell seem in character, and clearly Mitchell is being forced to do what he has to. But Nick is right about Mitchell being selfish even if he doesn't know about G-Man. Mitchell should really just sacrifice himself and allow the rest of the crew to live normally. He seems to have no burning desire to stay alive. He also has no hints as to anything returning to normal after he successfully kills Freeman, which is what Mitchell wants at this point. It's just weird for him to go through with this despite everything. Mitchell's motivations are very confused. After a loving staring contest with Adam and Nick, Mitchell commands his army to City 17. By that, he means he will actually not have his army with him for the time being, and he will instead be placed in the middle of a forest. Mitchell takes a train that goes down a tunnel, which was short enough to knock Mitchell off. But despite that, Mitchell ends up at the train station at the beginning of Half-Life 2. At this point, HDTF's story and Half-Life 2's story are taking place at the same time, so I'll be referencing both of them. Despite Mitchell not wearing a citizen uniform, the Combine are not concerned by Mitchell wandering around. He sends one of his recruits to explode the Combine security check, allowing him to escape into the city. Again, no one is concerned by Mitchell passing by them despite easily being able to apprehend him. After a lot of wandering, the Combine finally start trying to shoot Mitchell out of nowhere, including with a helicopter. I guess I got what I asked for eventually. After a little while, the player is meant to realize that getting apprehended is intentional, despite the game giving you numerous options to escape and Mitchell ends up in the Citadel. 
Uh, okay then. Mitchell eats up once again with Boris. Apparently Boris is working in the Citadel alongside Breen, and he has also met G-Man in the meantime. Apparently Boris refused to deal with G-Man, and he got the mere threat of losing his daughter. We don't know what this deal is, or why G-Man even consulted Boris in the first place. It's not like he miraculously survived any intense gunfights like Freeman, Adrian, or even Mitchell did. And, well, Alex included. Mitchell wants to side with the Combine and is willing to hand over his army of a hundred soldiers to them. Boris negotiates with Breen, and they accept Mitchell's offer to help hunt Freeman down. Since Freeman is at Black Mesa East at this point, the Combine have to go after him there. Before the scene ends, Boris mentions his daughter, Sasha, is a spy in the Resistance, and if she dies to Mitchell's hand, he will turn against Mitchell. With that, Mitchell is now working alongside the Combine, and a seed has been planted for later. It's not outright said, but Boris mentions he expected to meet Mitchell again, and so it's implied the reason Mitchell was taken to the Citadel was because Boris recognized Mitchell. Though it's not apparent what Boris's job even is in the Citadel, and it seems very likely that the Combine could not care less about who knows who. If they're an enemy, they get captured and experimented on. If Boris did recognize Mitchell and Breen allowed him to take Mitchell to the Citadel, that really should have been explained. This major event shouldn't be left up to implication. If Mitchell wasn't recognized and was simply sent to the Citadel to meet Boris for no reason, then why? No one else would get to defend themselves like that. In episode 1, it's heavily implied that anyone who resists is immediately turned in to be experimented on, so really how Mitchell ended up in the Citadel is a total mystery. And how come the factory Boris led 17 years ago, blowing up, wasn't pinned on Boris, and hence getting him fired or killed? Later, something a character does is loosely pinned on another, so clearly the Combine are willing to just pin the person in the wrong place at the wrong time. Too many unanswered questions. After that scene, Mitchell appears in Black Mesa East, with his army and Combine soldiers. The group goes through BME, massacring all of the Resistance members inside. Finally, at long last, you are playing the intended game. You are hunting down Gordon Freeman in the Resistance. This converges with the invasion of the Combine and BME. Another nice tie into Half-Life 2. Unfortunately, it's short-lived, as when you try to find Freeman, it appears he and the others have already escaped. Rather than search any further in BME, Mitchell decides to head into Ravenholm. He has no reason to believe Gordon isn't still in BME, and he has no contact with the Combine, but he just decides to leave anyway. You eventually escape Ravenholm and continue to hunt Resistance members. At this point, Mitchell is just killing innocent people and not Freeman, especially since he was so insistent on humanity thriving despite everything. This just feels like unnecessary violence on his part. After arbitrarily wandering through antline caves, just phoning in the references now, and seeing Freeman drive by in his buggy, Mitchell ends up in the middle of nowhere. Mitchell's journey is just happening at this point. We jump locations very quickly, somehow faster than Freeman is moving, and are finding Freeman purely on luck. There's no way Mitchell would have known Freeman was on a buggy driving to Nova Prospect. He has no direct communication with the Combine at this moment. Now after the caves were in a building, it wasn't much of a subtle transition like in episode 2, so it felt like an awkward location switch. After leaving the building, Mitchell ends up in a forest, not unlike the forest in episode 2, which feels very strange considering that the forest is quite far away from City 17, if you remember Gordon and Alex had to take a train to get there. And to get all the way here on foot that fast would be quite a feat. Also, why is Mitchell even in a forest? Freeman is on the coast. It's not implied the forest is any faster than the coast. Mitchell is just wandering around aimlessly at this point. He has no combined communication of whom, at this moment, are following Freeman. And he was simply assigned to go after Freeman alongside the combine. Why isn't Mitchell following the Combine? There's no other Combine forest out here. I'm so confused on the point of Mitchell's journey. He's unguided. And it turns out this forest base Mitchell is at is just a random rebel base. You're after Freeman. Gordon Freeman. Not a bunch of forest rebels. Come on, Mitchell. You're risking your death. How did he even walk into a rebel base unscathed but can't get out of one without being swarmed? Plus, how did these initial three rebels know Mitchell was a threat? There's no way they could have found out through the BME rebels who were almost entirely wiped out or were on the run. Then Mitchell picks up a fully fueled and fully functional motorcycle that has the exact same sound effects as Freeman's buggy. I am sure they have stock motorcycle sound effects somewhere on the internet, but whatever, that's a nitpick. He stops off in a mansion and finds another motorcycle. I question why we even needed the first one, as it was still functional last we saw it. We're just here to slaughter a bunch of rebels and destroy a combine gate which, for some reason, was still functional in this rebel base. The rebels are just guarding the controls like combine soldiers. 
These rebels are quite literally just reskinned combine soldiers without any of the environmental storytelling considered. Also, this mansion has a lot of windows in it. I don't know if that's the most ideal location to safely hide from the combine. Alas, after that massacre, we can finally drive to Nova Prospect. Now we're suddenly on the coastline, as intended. As we pass by, we see a few dropships heading into the building. This will be somewhat important in a moment. After going up the easily accessible elevator that leads directly into the building, which, mind you, is not far from that one large rebel base, hence making me wonder how they managed to survive. And of course, when you enter the building, it is completely empty. Yep, not a single combine soldier upon entering. No gunships or dropships or any kind of military machinery. Not even a single stalker. Uh, game developer, if that is your real name. You do remember that Mitchell is friends with the Combine, right? It's not like you needed to insert combat. You could just have them passively walking around like citizens. Given how large this room is, you'd think it'd be bustling. You could argue the Combine forces are out chasing Freeman, and so the numbers in Nova Prospect are decreased, but I would then argue that last we knew, Freeman was headed to Nova Prospect. There should be more soldiers here of all places. The Combine know that Freeman is heading to Nova Prospect, assuming he's not already there. Seemingly Mitchell knows too. The place should not be this empty and barren. Also, there are a lot of useless long rooms with just a few computers scattered around. It's not like there's anything below this place. These rooms are just long for no reason. After descending the Citadel-approved elevator, we've entered the room where Alex and Gordon teleported out of Nova Prospect and remained in limbo for a week. Okay, so we know this is an area that had a lot of soldiers. We saw elite soldiers come out just before teleportation, and yet the room leading right to this location was empty. What? And the teleportation room is empty too, despite there being a lot of soldiers here in Half-Life 2. And I do mean a lot of soldiers. At this point, Mitchell goes through another hallway into another part of Nova Prospect, presumably to escape. So yeah, this journey was pretty much useless. No comment from Mitchell during all of this either. Why have a talking protagonist if he's gonna stay silent anyway? After sliding through a water pipe, we cut to Mitchell being in a jail cell. In Nova Prospect still, by the looks of it. This is a lot at once, give me a second. Okay, so how did we get from this water pipe, mind you, far away from the jail cells in Nova Prospect, to being in a jail cell? Why are we still in Nova Prospect? Freeman is gone, he teleported away, mission failed. Nova Prospect is literally falling apart. Lastly, why is he locked in jail? Well, okay, maybe that question will be answered shortly. Mitchell wakes up and finds Sasha, who is Boris's daughter. Remember her? I sure didn't. Apparently Sasha is going to release Mitchell from the jail cell, telling him to go to the monitor room. No explanation as to why Mitchell was locked up. Considering this area has rebels in it, it could be assumed he was captured and locked up by the rebels, and since Sasha is an undercover rebel, she could safely find Mitchell. Fine, that makes sense, but it's left up to theory. And how come the rebels locked up Mitchell anyway? How did they even get him to this area of Nova Prospect? Why are they living in this area of Nova Prospect? At this point, I'm not even certain we're in Nova Prospect, even though the game says we are. This just feels wrong. Nova Prospect is heavily guarded with Combine soldiers, and yet seemingly the rebels safely took shelter here. My god, these rebels are terrible at picking hiding spots. Unarmed, because for some reason Sasha couldn't be bothered to give him a weapon despite him escaping a guarded rebel base, Mitchell finds his way to the elusive monitor room to meet with Sasha. Not many rebels outside of that one jail block, fortunately. Now that Mitchell is here, we finally approach THE scene of the game. The one that had the Half-Life fandom in knots years after release. Mitchell awkwardly talks with a very poorly modeled and textured Sasha about heroism and whatnot. Sasha explains that she remembers Mitchell saving children 17 years ago, something I don't believe she remembered for a second, and Mitchell makes an edgy remark. Mitchell insists he is the villain even though Sasha tries to give him the benefit of the doubt. I have no idea why. Sasha must know she and Mitchell are siding with the objectively bad people. Then Mitchell asks what happened after he left the factory in Alaska. She tells the story as though she's writing a novel, and apparently her great memory suddenly goes blurry after being saved from the factory. By G-Man, apparently. Before explaining the deal Sasha and Boris got from G-Man, she's suddenly shot through the head by Adam. Apparently the bullet that fully penetrated Sasha's head did not in fact hit Mitchell, who was directly in front of her. That was lucky. Anyway, before we have a moment to properly process what just happened, Adam tells Mitchell to run. And so Mitchell runs. After a little while of running with Adam, he directs Mitchell to a hallway and locks the door behind him. For whatever reason, there was a random cell door in this hallway. Adam reminisces and confirms that Nova Prospect is about to explode. I am still wondering why the rebels decided to camp here considering they're all about to die. Adam says that sabotaging Mitchell was part of the deal, and G-Man is waiting for Mitchell outside. G-Man repeats lines from the original Half-Life again, and describes that Mitchell was used well, and that his mission is complete. Mitchell counters that G-Man promised he would be able to kill Gordon Freeman, but only ended up losing a bunch of his men. G-Man corrects, saying he never promised Freeman would die, then says the one who actually betrayed Mitchell was right by his side. 
that is to say, Adam. We see the scene of Mitchell being pummeled by a crowbar on Black Mesa again, multiple times, forwards and backwards. And then finally from supposedly Gordon Freeman's perspective. But wait! Alas! It's not Gordon Freeman, it's Adam! He was assigned by G-Man to attack Mitchell. Mitchell processes this extremely quickly, with seemingly very little anger, considering he basically wasted 20 years of his life hunting someone who doesn't even know him. G-Man explains that now that Sasha is dead, Boris will turn on Mitchell and send the Combine after him. The point was to make Freeman have an easier path to defeating the Citadel, now that a lot of the Combine are at Mitchell's throat. G-Man leaves, saying he has their permission to die. I too like the Dark Knight. Mitchell quickly throws in one more question, wondering what will happen if he survives the Combine onslaught. We're left on G-Man smiling at Mitchell, the implication being that Mitchell could end up being one of G-Man's clients, not unlike Gordon Freeman. Okay. Deep breaths. That was a lot to take in at once. Now this may shock you, but I don't have entirely bad things to say about this scene. In fact, I think the scene was decently well done in a vacuum. What I mean is, if you cut out the context of Half-Life 2, then yes, this scene makes sense. G-Man's only priority was Gordon Freeman, and he made little deals with other people to slowly twist fate in Freeman's favor. Honestly, I think that's a really neat concept, though unfortunately, I have a number of problems with it as well. Let's start by staying within the bounds of this game and not touching Half-Life 2 yet. Firstly, Mitchell expresses that after the 17 year time skip that he no longer has the motivation to hunt down Freeman. It's heavily implied this is due to the ravages of the Combine and the fact that a lot of time has passed. So why not push the Freeman attack ahead in time? Why not put Mitchell in stasis? Why make it so that, at this point, Mitchell doesn't care about Freeman anymore and hence lessening the effect of G-Man's intention? If Mitchell indeed did not care about hunting Freeman, then why did he still go after Freeman throughout the entire chapter? If his motivations were aligned, he wouldn't have made a deal with Boris and wouldn't have enacted the ticking time bomb to help deter the Combine away from Freeman. The entire point of the deal with Boris was to go after Gordon Freeman. That's it. Mitchell didn't care about living anymore. He could have submitted himself to the Combine and that be that. Heck, he could have accepted Boris's deal but not gone through with it just to survive. But Mitchell's motivations are unaligned for this to work. Quite simply, make it so Mitchell is not sick of hunting Freeman, which would be quite an unrealistic character trait if we still apply the time skips. But at least G-Man's plan would seem a little more stable. Secondly, how come Sasha and Boris needed to meet with G-Man anyway? Boris, Sasha, Adam, and Mitchell are all confirmed to be clients of G-Man in this plan and Gordon Freeman. Adam and Mitchell were extremely necessary, as Adam acted as Mitchell's main motivation, which inevitably led to the Combine chasing Mitchell and thus helping Freeman. Sasha was somewhat important in that she needed to help Mitchell escape, but as I described earlier, the fact that Mitchell even got captured by the rebels made no sense. Sasha could have been cut out of the plan altogether. Boris, on the other hand, was likely told by G-Man that he needed to make a deal with Mitchell that put that ticking time bomb on Mitchell. Likely Boris was motivated via manipulation, like Mitchell. However, this is all based on theory. It'd be nice to have some kind of confirmation on why Boris was even one of G-Man's clients. Any father would be motivated to keep his daughter alive. I could see Boris sending the Combine after Mitchell as just one of Boris's character traits. My point is, there isn't a clear reason as to why G-Man was involved with Boris and Sasha, but I can appreciate this game for at least trying to make G-Man morally grey as he's presented in the original games, not necessarily siding with any person in particular. That's really the only positive I can pull from this. Lastly, why was Adam picked? Adam has pretty much no motivation to work with G-Man, as no motivations of his have ever been established to the audience or to Mitchell. He's just a mysterious character with unknown motivations, but that puts the G-Man deal in a lot of jeopardy. If we don't know Adam's motivations to work with G-Man and eventually have Mitchell chasing after him, that we have no reason to believe Adam should work with G-Man. Boris could have been motivated to keep his daughter safe, and in turn, Sasha's motivation is her own safety. Mitchell was motivated by cold hard revenge. Adam? We don't know. And hey, where's the third guy? What's his name? Uh, Nick, right. Where's Nick in all of this? We haven't seen him since the beginning of this chapter. I guess he's just one of Mitchell's friends. I don't know why he hasn't tried helping Mitchell at all if this is the case. Feels a bit silly to have a whole other secondary character who has no motivations, no involvement with the main plot, and who does practically nothing to help Mitchell. Well, until the end, but we're not quite there yet. Now let's consider the context of Half-Life 2. In Half-Life 2, the Combine are very much at Freeman's throat, even before he returns to City 17. They sent helicopters after him, and gunships, and swaths of soldiers. After the weak time skip, we discover that the Combine have labeled Freeman as Anti-Citizen 1, which is code word for Freeman is our number one threat. This is heavily implied to be due to Freeman destroying Nova Prospect and indirectly sparking a rebel uprising. So if there was any point for the Combine to zone in on killing Freeman, it would be post-Nova Prospect. 
And yet, here we are, post-Nova Prospect, being convinced that Breen would allow Boris to send a large enough percent of the Combine after Mitchell to help Freeman's path be easier. I absolutely do not believe that. Mitchell worked alongside the Combine, expressed his desire to take down Freeman, and yet now that Boris is a widow sad that his daughter got killed, he's permitted to send a large percentage of the Combine forces exclusively in Mitchell's direction. Mitchell did not cause nearly the amount of destruction to the Combine forces that Freeman caused. It's not even comparable. He worked with the Combine more than he fought against it, to the knowledge of Breen anyway. The majority, if not the entirety, of the Combine forces should be aimed at Freeman in the Rebels. One man who has hardly caused any destruction or uprising does not deserve a large enough percentage of the Combine to come after him. Only if G-Man somehow made a deal with Breen on allowing this to happen would I even believe this would be able to happen. But we don't even hear about Breen outside of the Citadel chat with Boris. Are we forgetting that Breen is the puppet leader of Earth? He's not even the leader of Earth. He'd have to approach the Combine themselves. No way would G-Man make a deal with the Combine just so Freeman has a slightly easier time fighting off the Combine. This entire theory I just made up based on the most logical through points makes no sense. And of course, we're all actually left in the dark as to how this deal was even allowed to happen. I'm flabbergasted. The entire motivation of G-Man in this game falls apart when you simply look at the surface level events in Half-Life 2. But I won't deny it was a half-decent attempt at a twist. It certainly had some logical pillars underneath it. But frankly, this entire motivation for making Freeman's journey just a little easier has fundamental problems to it. The entire motivation of hunting down Gordon Freeman is fundamentally flawed. And hence, this game couldn't actually make you hunt down Freeman himself. No, instead you hunt down Adam, their OC. This entire game attempted to be a bait and switch, and instead, undoubtedly, left many Half-Life fans disappointed. Mitchell is no longer Gordon Freeman's enemy. He is no longer the villain. The entire tagline of this game is false now. What a massive disappointment. Either make this an AU where you literally have the opportunity to hunt down Freeman, or don't even bother. Okay, now that I've sufficiently killed my voice reading all that out, let's calm down a bit. Where is Mitchell now? Why is he in the middle of nowhere in another forest, no less? Stop changing locations with no explanation for it! Why does Nova Prospect even lead right onto a forest anyway? Sorry, now I can actually calm down. So, Mitchell is in the forest now. He seemingly still doesn't have much to say about what's going on and what he just learned, especially considering he's been shown to speak aloud to himself. After coming upon another random doorway, Mitchell finds a large combine-made bridge just on the side of the forest mountain. Combine soldiers are attacking and Mitchell has to fight them off. He contacts Nick, somehow, and wants him to pick up Mitchell from this bizarre location. I don't know why he didn't just stay in the forest and instead walk directly into the hornet's nest, but whatever. Also, Mitchell asks where Freeman is, even though, frankly, at this point, he should not care at all about Freeman. He knows the Combine are after him regardless of where Freeman is. And hey, why did Mitchell put the fault of G-Man's plan on Adam? Adam was just a piece in the game of chess. He wasn't the one who orchestrated the plan. I don't know why Mitchell specifically hates Adam so much and not G-Man. Please allow me to go a minute without finding something to complain about. Nick says goodbye to Mitchell in a far more respectful way than I would have expected, from the man who pushed back against Mitchell every other time the two have shared a room. Either way, Nick is on the way. After an astoundingly intense fight with zero aerial artillery, not counting the dropships, Mitchell is saved. Wow, so that's the chunk that managed to help Freeman out doesn't seem really worth the effort it took to get here. Also, Mitchell has 200 health for some reason. He doesn't have an HEV suit powered by Citadel energy, so there's no reason for him to have a sudden health boost. Okay, okay, let me proceed finally. Mitchell is saved by helicopter and dropped onto the ship from the beginning of the chapter. Guess who else is here somehow? Adam, of course. Who knows how he got into the ship? For the final cutscene, we see Mitchell finally able to hunt down quote-unquote Freeman. By that I mean Adam. Of course, this is just a cutscene with zero player interaction, so we still couldn't even hunt down Fig Freeman ourselves. We just had to watch it. After a rather intimate scene of Mitchell murdering Adam and spouting edgy lines, Mitchell turns to his crew and declares they are heading to the Borealis. And that's it. Yep, we've just been left on possibly the stupidest line in this entire game. And that's really saying something. Let's start with the absolutely massive elephant in the room. Why does Mitchell want to go to the Borealis? How does he even know about the Borealis? Gordon and his gang of science friends found out via Mossman, who was essentially a double agent in the Combine, several days after the events of Half-Life 2. At this point, Mitchell has no contact with the Combine, and any contact prior had nothing to do with the Borealis. At this point, it's quite likely that the Combine don't even know about the Borealis yet, but I can't say with absolute certainty. Mitchell has absolutely zero reason to know about the Borealis. And even if he did know, why would he want to go there? He's not motivated to save humanity, 
he's not motivated to help the Combine. He doesn't care about Freeman anymore. So what's his motivation to go to the Borealis? This is literally the first and last mention or hint of the Borealis in the entire game. I'm completely lost. What was the point of this cliffhanger? I have no idea where the developers would even go with this concept. I almost wish they had made a sequel though. More content for me. Next up, what exactly is Mitchell planning on doing about the Combine? Because don't forget, the Combine are not done with Mitchell. Boris was quite clear that he would kill Mitchell. What, is it implied he's safe because he made it to the ship? Man, the Combine are very incompetent. Why not follow the helicopter Mitchell took to the ship? You do want to kill Mitchell, right? D-Man's plan is still in action, correct? We're just left with so many questions, and frankly a very unsatisfying ending. The new conflict of the story hasn't been closed at all, and it just got sidelined when Mitchell's murderous urges against Adam kicked in. Adam was the problem 20 years ago, the Combine is the problem now. Speaking of, why was Mitchell so angry at Adam? I briefly mentioned this just earlier, but like, seriously. Why was all of Mitchell's anger directed at Adam? The only reasonable explanation is because he shot Sasha and indirectly sent the Combine after Mitchell. Otherwise, it's because Adam pummeled Mitchell's face in 20 years ago. But Adam was just a pawn in G-Man's game. Surely Mitchell, a fellow client of G-Man, would have a little bit of sympathy towards Adam, given he's just playing by G-Man's rules, just as Mitchell had. For all we know, Adam was tricked and manipulated just as Mitchell was. Adam never really sabotaged Mitchell outside of G-Man's plan. It's not like Adam himself was all that bad of a person. He was just presented as mysterious. And the problem with a mysterious character is that we can't follow their motivations, unless we find it hard to judge their character. But what we got made it seem like Adam was just a guy playing along with G-Man's plan. If anything, Mitchell should be upset at G-Man. G-Man sent Mitchell into the 20 year aimless hunt sent Adam after him in the first place, as Adam would have no reason to attack Mitchell otherwise, they basically sentenced him to death. G-Man plucked Mitchell from Black Mesa and used him to help another guy out, whom Mitchell doesn't even know. Mitchell seems very calm around G-Man. It doesn't seem as though he's afraid or hesitant to come after G-Man. It just seems like he's very gullible and wants to pin the blame on Adam. We don't get much insight into the character's motivations, including the protagonist who has ruined the silent player aspect of Half-Life just to say pretty much nothing insightful. I would much rather have exposition-y blatant dialogue, because it's better than pretty much being in the dark the entire game. <sighs> Lastly, I'm going to briefly talk about the secret death cut scenes you see when Mitchell dies during the final section. And one of them, Mitchell appears in a tram with a bunch of Gordon Freemans. Yes, this is where that what the f audio from that Yandere Dev team fake comes from, believe it or not. I suppose the implication here is that because Mitchell is one of G-Man's clients, that means he and Gordon Freeman alike have multiple lives or something like that. So the dead copies just sit here for eternity. I guess it's to show how alike Freeman and Mitchell are. I kind of wish that it had been explored a little more in the actual game rather than just hinted to here. Secondly, there's another cutscene where Mitchell once again meets another of G-Man's clients. Adrian Shepard, the man himself, left in indefinite stasis. But wait! Mitchell recognizes Adrian, who is wearing a mask, mind you, as his brother from the start. Yep. Mitchell Shepard is his full name. What an absolutely pointless reveal. What does it matter that Adrian and Mitchell are related? Why is Mitchell even in the tram stasis if Mitchell died but Adrian didn't? G-Man surely didn't save Mitchell because he wanted Mitchell dead. I guess all of this explains why Mitchell went into the military though, because Adrian also did. I just don't see why I should care considering Adrian is entirely irrelevant to the story, minus the beginning cutscene and this one-off death cutscene. This was definitely just to get the audience to go gasp without any thought behind it. And no, no one was impressed by this reveal. In fact, I don't even think many people know about it. Shows how little it mattered to the story. Anyway, with all that, we've reached the end of the game. Well, half game, half SFM cinematics. I'm sure most people who have heard of Hunt Down the Freeman are mainly familiar with how sucky the gameplay is. And yeah, I played this game for the background footage you've seen throughout the video. It was really unpleasant. But I felt as though people, for the most part, glossed over the story. Half-Life 2 is my all-time favorite game in part because I love the story so much. It took Half-Life's amazing lore and amplified it in a really fun way. Hunt Down the Freeman took a look at Half-Life's lore and decided, what if we just did nothing to expand on that in any way? And we ended up with this sorely flawed and boring storyline. We don't get much expansion on Zen or the Combine. We just get a brief glimpse of the Seven Hour War, find out a guy named Boris apparently works with them, and G-Man apparently influenced the Combine in Freeman's favor. That's about it. None of these things change the way I look at Half-Life 2. Boris is not an important enough character for me to care about. 
G-Man's plan in this story was pretty much just finding any excuse to get original characters involved with Gordon Freeman. The Combine did not come after Mitchell enough for me to feel like there was an actual impact on Mitchell's end that could have believably influenced Half-Life 2's story. This game just added a few extra soldiers and then threw them directly at Mitchell. Where's any sense of development with Half-Life 2's lore? All I'm saying is, you could avoid playing Hunt down the Freeman your entire life and literally nothing would change about you. The cool thing about games like Black Mesa, the unofficial remake of Half-Life, is that it builds on existing parts of Half-Life's lore, see Zen mainly. It develops the science team, showing them as being more knowledgeable on Zen and its life. It develops the section in Interloper to more properly establish the Vortigaunt society. You go back to Half-Life and realize, huh, this is a bit underwhelming in comparison. In fact, I think most people realize the Interloper Vortigaunts in Half-Life were harmless thanks to Black Mesa. Me included. Mind you, this is just a recreation of Half-Life. Imagine the wholly original storylines people have created with Half-Life as its base, expanding upon it in ways that make the original franchise better. Hunt Down the Freeman could not be bothered. I don't want to think about the storyline anymore, it just makes me disappointed this has to be attached to such a wonderful franchise, pulling it down a bit with it. G-Man's plan made no sense, we learned very little about the Combine, we learned nothing new about Zen or Black Mesa, we don't even hear about Alex or Kleiner or Barney or even Eli for heaven's sake. We briefly hear about Brain. Really, there was no need for this to be related to Half-Life at all. Though, if this was a wholly original story, I wouldn't have much faith in it given how poorly the story was handled. And there you go. Now you know why Hunt Down the Freeman has a flawed story. Sorry devs, but no gameplay fixes are gonna fix the fundamental problems in the story. Good attempt at gameplay fixes, though. It looks slightly more bearable than the original released version. Either way, that's it for me. Yeah, sorry if I got your hopes up in the last video by making you think I was talking about an actual official Half-Life game. Maybe I will talk about an official Half-Life game someday. Actually, I'd probably review them all in one video. But the next video won't be about Half-Life at all. Funnily enough, it'll be yet another game with half cinematics and half gameplay. Well, actually, mostly cinematics. Good luck figuring it out. And lastly, I feel the need to advertise my own Half-Life AU project called Dawn of Revolution. It's a comic in very early planning stages, but will be released for free when finished. If you want to learn more about it, check out my card, or ask in the comments. I'll answer questions. Thank you for watching! I'll see you all whenever I manage my next video. Goodbye.